Mr. Mark Wahlberg. Mr. Mark Wahlberg. Mr. Michael K. Williams. And the film's director, Mr. Rupert Wyatt. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, everybody involved in the film for being here today, and I'd like to congratulate them on making a really engrossing and provocative motion picture. Uh, as many of you are aware, this is a film that's uh, based on a 1974 picture uh, written by James Toback and directed by Carol Reese, which Toback um, wrote based not only on his own experiences, but also inspired by Dostoevsky's novella, The Gambler, uh, about compulsive behavior and uh, gambling. This version of the film, uh, while uh, certainly honoring the uh, 1974 version, kind of kicks it up a notch. And uh, it's a film also about the derailing, I think, of the American dream. So uh, I wanted to ask uh, William and Rupert about how that uh, theme emerged during the idea of, of, of doing a rethink of, of this picture that, uh, as I said, the theme goes all the way back to Dostoevsky, gets on the cast to weigh in. Then we'll open it up to you guys. How's that sound? Good. Great. Uh, William or Rupert, if you want to start that? Well, as far as derailing the American dream is concerned, I took the... Uh, <laughs> 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 that <must be> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I'd say, just to, just to start off, the fundamental difference for me when I read the script was I, I knew the original, I knew of the original, um, but I saw that it was clearly not a, less a study of addiction, more the notion of <clears throat> what it means to be a gambler in, in, in this world today, especially in Western society, that kind of win-lose mentality, the sink or swim. And this is a guy who has everything, has all of these social trappings, but it's a gilded cage. And he's somebody who clearly wants to escape it. He uses gambling as a it's okay, the, 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 the recording devices are yeah, there. Yeah, so. yeah, it's surprising. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's that, it was an anti-materialistic movie. That's what I found fascinating about it. It's about an overdog wanting to become an underdog. And I think um, that's quite a rare, a rare gem in this thing. William, well, when, when, you, when you wrote this script, uh, I mean, what was, if you could describe your process a little bit, I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in the John Goodman character and his, uh, his fuck you money speech um, there. I don't know, I guess, I guess it's, uh, in some way, it's a sort of philosophy of life that I think it sh I share. Um, but it, as far as writing the thing is concerned, it, it's um, the uh, 74 film, which came out when I was 13, uh, was about gambling addiction, and uh, I, I happen to come from a mindset where I think everything is voluntary. You know, like right now, I really want a Marlboro, but if I if I have one, I've made a choice to do it, and if I have one after that, I've made a choice to do it. So I don't believe in addiction per se. You know, there's obviously substance dependencies of various kinds, but those are also voluntary too. You know, if you're, if you're on, you know, if you go off heroin, as I understand it, you feel just like not top notch for about a week. <laughs> you know, so uh, I, I don't believe in addiction and uh, there, therefore, because I don't believe in addiction, half of what there was to begin with just fell away. And I was able to sort of romp with it as everybody else was able to romp with it. The three characters uh, that uh, Michael, Mark, and, and Brie all play are all, I think, uh, aspiring to things, but they're all after different things and their hustle, each of their individual hustles represents a different kind of approach. So before we open it up to the floor, I thought maybe I'd get uh, Michael, Mark, and Bree to talk about their approach to characters relative to that idea. 
Ladies. I'm like the least hustler of this group. <laughs> I'm not saying a hustler per se, but you're clearly, you have an agenda. I don't think she does. I think that's why I enjoy playing her so much. I think, I think that's why Jim loved her so much. Mm. I think that, in my mind, when I read the script, I believed that these sort of seven days of soul initiation, when he lets go of things over the course of seven days, that Amy has gone through those seven days before the movie began. So she represents to him this place to get to. Okay. He recognizes that her, that's exactly what he's looking for. Basically, uh, I think level, you know, it, it, it looks at Jim as a mirror in some aspects, you know, uh, if Jim's mad at, you know, from the outside looking in, appears to have everything, uh, status, money, education, good looks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and people look at ne uh, Neville, I think, in a similar fashion, you know, chicks from um, money, power, respect, and, um, you know, he sees, you know, like, they're both searching, they, 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 they want something else out of life. Like you said, the trappings of their world starts to suffocate them. I think that's what uh, he finds attractive in, in Jim. All right, we're going to open it up to the audience. Uh, if your question's not genius, please don't bother. Um, <laughs> yes. Yes, I always say my own. Wait for the microphone. Remember that. Um, uh, would I ask you if you do believe in addiction? Um, uh, I do to a certain extent, yes. Yes, I do. What, what was the question? Do uh, I whether addiction? Mark believes in addiction. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, this, isn't that biological addiction and that synthetic addiction? There's a big difference. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry for such a short answer. Okay. This gentleman uh, right here, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, guys. Um, clearly, this film is a dark story of redemption. And I'm wondering if Jim Bennett, towards the end, do you think he actually um, changed his ways? Did he? Because he's an impulsive, edgy character, and he went through a lot. And that last scene where I don't want to give anything away, I'm wondering if maybe he did change his ways, considering everything he's been through. Well, the great thing between Rupert and I is we would always have those discussions. Um, how long did it actually take him to ring her doorbell and knock on that door? Was uh, he more nervous starting over? Than, uh, and getting through, you know, the danger that was that he faced with Neville's character, John Goodman, uh, with Michael's character, John Goodman's character, and the Korean gangsters. Uh, so that was a fun conversation to have. Yeah, I, I think I mean there's a specific um, line of dialogue at the beginning of this movie spoken by his grandfather, which is, "I need to know what you'll be worth, and I need you nothing." That's 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 the challenge. That's, that's what sets Jim up off on this quest. He's a guy who has everything but wants to get back to zero and without not to it away. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's his goal. So it is a redemption story. It's quite an aspirational story in a funny sort of way. It's a guy who, who is looking for a way out and realizes, and he's, he's somebody who lives his life by a code. So again, less like an addict who is somebody who is more surfing the drain, who is somebody who's not necessarily in control of their addictions. This is a guy who actually has a very clear agenda and, um, and a very clear intent of self-destruction. And self-destruction with the idea that if he can self-destruct, then he can possibly start again. So he says to Amy, he says, if I come to your door, you know that I, I, I made it. So that, that really was um, the, key, the key to the door that leads him you know, out, out of his previous life. This uh, person here, please. Robin, <coughs> Hey, Mark. Nice to see everybody. Uh, it was a great performance. I just want to follow up a little bit on this question about if you believed in addiction, because you've always been really open to the press about your demons. So how did this film and this character resonate with you personally? Uh, well, for me, it was, it was very different from anything that I've done before. You know, I am used to playing the underdogs as opposed to the guy who has everything and is searching, is, is trying to strip himself of all that to become the underdog. So it, it, it was very different. Um, I have a lot of people in my life who suffer from various addictions. Uh, gambling was uh, 
it's a big part of my upbringing. So those are things that I could identify with. But the big appeal to me was saying the words created by this gentleman. Maybe then after working with him on The Departed, working with him on a hobby, uh, and him writing out very desperate for us. You know, anytime you get to to speak the words of William Ryan, you know, I'll be the first one to sign up. Uh, I'd like to know about most of the films I've seen you in, you're always the bravado and you're always the one that's beating the other person. So how was it for you to change that type of persona and... Well, my first thing was always to fight back. And, and, I, and I wanted to know with Michael, how was it uh, working with Mark and being the one that's actually beating him up or having someone to beat him up? It's both of you. Yeah, that's right, Mark. I can't tell you how relieved that was when I got to the set and saw that Mark had lost 60 pounds. <laughs> I, was, I was freaking out, man. I had to get to the gym. I had to get to the gym. You know, um, you know Mark is brilliant, man. He's, 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 this man is, is uh, amazing to watch um, work. I learned a lot from him. He, he um, you know, he allowed himself to be vulnerable and, and to give himself to the character, you know, he, stepped, he got out of his way and allowed, you know, Jim to, to, to shine and it, it wasn't just his physical, uh, his appearance, it was his demeanor and everything and like, you know, Mark, Mark's first guess of course would be to fight back, you know, Boston boy, you know what I mean, but uh, that's not Jim's reality and he, uh, he just, he was, he was, that's what actors do. Yeah, and I, I, I've known Michael for a very long time before I ever acted in a film. Uh, Michael and I knew each other uh, through mutual friends, so it was great to get an opportunity to finally work with him, even though we worked together on a boardwalk, I never acted with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's uh, menacing in an effortless way, um, <laughs> but uh, always very kind and gracious when we're on set. Can I ask you to move that tall water bottle? Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, I'm happy to move to Paul. One of the things that's the flip side of this is also the deception of hope. There's always these moments where you hope he's going to uh, pull the money away and, and walk away. And, and, and so I think you toy with us in a lot of ways. I'd love to hear, I would like to have gotten a picture of the discussion about that side of the, the film, which you address in a variety of ways, the way uh, gambling creates the sense of, well, I'm just going to get myself out of it. I just have that one more uh, win or or you make all these wins and you're just gonna, I'm going to double it now. And I'd love to hear all of you know, maybe to get an inside look at the conversation that all of you had about that. You know, it's common. Sure. Um, well, it was always a challenge in an interesting way because you don't get more high stakes than gambling in, in, in a literal sense in, in, the, in the idea of the, the anticipation of what's going to come. But at the same time, gambling is not a particularly interesting thing to watch. It might not be, you know, it's actually boring to watch them. and it's much more of a player sport than a spectator sport. So when I was approaching it and when we were talking about how do, how do we convey this idea that here's this guy who's stepping up to the table, he internally knows full well that he intends to stay at that table until he's blown every amount, you know, every single dollar in his pocket. But at the same time you can't you can't relate that to the audience because of course then you get rid of the mistakes. And so we were always running this you know, without being uh, disingenuous with the audience and, and deceitful, we were, we were always conveying this notion of what, what was behind the eyes. There's one particular moment in the Veronica Casino scene where, which actually is one of the few times we did do something very close to the original, which is Jimmy Khan hits a three on an 18 and, you know, he goes to heaven. It's this shot. It's, he's lit like this, this kind of circular thing above his head and he's, you know, very angelic and he's euphoric and, um, um, his performance is very elated, and uh, the way Mark played it, which was terrific, was just this ambiguity. He didn't seem to care. He didn't seem to be happy nor sad. And it's because he knows he's going to stay at the table until he gets rid of all the two hundred sixty thousand dollars. So, it, again, it's this reverse notion. You know, you always look at gambling movies and you think the character is going to go into the casino with the hope and intent of staying till, at the table till they they get jackpot. That's the aim. Whereas with this movie, he's going in to blow it. So we were always trying to subvert in that way. The funny thing about gambling in movies is you, know, you have 50 years of James Bond films, and I don't think anybody in this room knows how to play background. 
<laughs> it's one of those things where it's more symbolical than, than, yeah. than, than operational. Yeah. But the three of you as actors, all the three of you as actors, which is why I addressed the question, the three of you as actors had to make us think that you thought at one point or another, you know, you had to be believing and convince other people that you were, you would think you were going to make your story. Michael, for example, when you were, uh, you know, watching the basketball game or even Bree when you were following him. And I'd like to hear how you guys felt about playing that ambiguity or creating that sense of you're believing that you're you're going to blow it or you might blow it. I didn't say you got a follow up. No, I wasn't following up. I asked that. Kidding, 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 kidding. I kind of agree with the group, but it wasn't, you know, so much about the game itself. I, I, I was intrigued by, um, you know, by our tennis is 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 the ball. You know, like, you know, like this guy gonna come through. Is he gonna, you know, is he gonna keep to his word on and, and just is he like you know, a breath of fresh air? The fact that you know he came into the casino didn't care about the money, just you know dumbed it down and and you know he didn't lie. You know, it's just a man that would say, uh, you know, I don't have any money, but if you want your money, you'll give me more money. You know, like, what? That's that's. Not the normal thing in that world. I think he was more intrigued with um, seeing if Jim was gonna be a match's word, and and because the Neville lends the least amount of money out of the, the three. Right. You know, um, I don't think you know this. Yes, his reputation is on the line. He can't let it be known that you know he did not get paid. But I don't think it was so much about the game or the money. It was more about is this man gonna keep his word and. I was, I was just going to end for him. And I don't think that Amy thinks that he's going to the casino to win at all. She knows exactly what it is that he's doing. And you see in the scene where they're throwing the bag of money back and forth. It's his way of like tossing the power back and forth because she doesn't want. She never touches it. She buys her own drink. And all she does is sit there and waits and knows that she's there as a way of support through this moment, but not there's no expectation, and that's the interesting thing I think about her and as you watch her through this movie. She's not expecting him or asking him to change or be anything else. All she's doing is she's staying her straight course. She's following him through this moment and hoping that he goes the right way. If he doesn't, then that's his choice. Yes. Um, yes, this question is for the filmmakers. Uh, could you talk about what you were going for metaphorically? With the uh, towards the end scene of the descent and the different levels of the building, it was it Dante's circles of hell, capitalism, or whatever. And were you going for something different than the original? Yeah, there's that that French saying. I can't remember what it is in, in French anyway. But um, uh, where you know, to reach the surface, you have to touch the bottom of the swimming pool. And that's why you can push off. But um, I I set this journey with the idea that we started as far west in America as you could possibly get right on the Pacific Coast Highway, um, up high in this, in this uh, sort of neoclassical building there would be statues that look like angels, and this white marble, and it had this very um, heavenly feel. So that's where he starts, he starts in paradise. And then through the course of the journey, he travels across Los Angeles, goes further and further east, and goes more underground, and by the end he's centering the dragon on the beast. He is, you know, this is in the other world, or whatever it is, Dante, um, with this idea. Um, but he doesn't really have a guide, so it's not, it's less Dante, but, but, uh, but this notion that you, in order to get out, you have to get to hell first. So that, that, was, that was very clearly an agenda on my part to sort of track his journey um, across Los Angeles, um, going deeper and deeper, and then, you know, the dawn at the end, obviously, the sun coming out. So, yeah. I love the classroom scenes, uh, in particular when uh, Jim is telling Amy that if she, well, the whole class, that if, if you're not going to be the best, you might as well not do it. And I want to ask William if that's his standard as a writer, and also Mark and you, if that's your standard as actors. If you're not going to be the absolute best, is it worth doing it? Um, I, I don't. I don't know if I commit 100 percent to what he says. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's obviously, a, you know, it, it's obviously definitely important to do the best you can. I think. I think Jim is holding himself to a, uh, an extremely high standard. 
and holding other people to an extremely high standard. And uh, <clears throat> I, I was asked recently by an interviewer, is he a, a failed artist? Is that what drives him? And I, I don't think he is. You know, I'm not sure. He's, he's not mine anymore. He's become Rupert and Marks. <laughs> you know, and uh, it's a it's a question about whether he's a uh, a failed artist because, of course, Amy does say to him that he has talent. It could be symptomatic of what he's going through that he feels he isn't any good. And um, I don't I don't know if I answered anything, but mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I I didn't went towards the uh, conclusion that I intended, but uh, that's that's what I've got. <laughs> I'd like to pick up on what um, Mr. Monahan, what you just said about the character became um, Mark Wahlberg and Rupert Wyatt. And with that, with that, um, he it wasn't until first of all it was such a it created such a I felt a stench that his his habit created such a stench that when as far as a gambler, you know it wasn't it wasn't a redeemable character until the last. You know, two minutes of the film when he totally redeems himself and everything is wiped clean. And I wanted to ask you, since that was, since it did become um, Mark Wahlberg and, and Rupert's uh, character, how did you guys come about to make that for such a, a swarmy guy that can instantly redeem himself? I never I mean, I, again, it's going back to this idea that if he sets out on day one with a with an intent, which is to get back to zero, I think that's <coughs> look. If this again going back to this idea that if this was a story of addiction, then of course it would be a cop out to end a movie in the way that we did. No one, no one can escape that demons. They just learn how to control it. That's how I see things, and, and many people do. So the fact that he's able to start again, he says it himself at the end of the movie. He says, "I'm not actually a gambler." So. Um, I think, it, I think it's clearly his intention from the get-go that uh, through the various means that he has at his disposal, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wipe myself out. And the, one of the key things he does, and uh, the way he does it, is, is through honesty. He's, he's a brutally honest individual, which I think is a, a really good quality, obviously. And it's what Amy sees in him, um, which is why you know, they have that, that confrontation at the beginning of the movie in the lecture, but that's where she, she's drawn into him. Um, but, uh, but with that honesty and with that intent, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really clear code. So I think he's, um, he's a pretty solid guy, I think. Mm. Right here. Um, before the uh, for, for Mark is the producer, the writer, and the director. Um, there were kind of these chicken soup for the gambler's soul sort of monologues throughout the film. And I was wondering, um, were there philosophical influences, even if there were your own, in the creation of this picture? And um, is that kind of your intended takeaway for the audience, is this philosophy? Well, you can never tell what anybody's going to take away, can you? I mean, you can put something out, but you don't know what the takeaway is going to be. You can't predict it. But did, like, were there any philosophical were there any philosophical influences for you guys, since there are these really large monologues, and I was just wondering what the, um, where the draw came from them? Uh, well, for me, it was just what I was thinking of, and in many cases, it was uh, in antithesis to the original uh, story about gambling addiction. And uh, <coughs> that's, that's about, it's, it's more or less what, you know, in the beginning, as I say, um, <laughs> the, uh, it was just what I think about things. And then, of course, it gets, gets passed off. And, uh, made and subjected to other thoughts and influences. That said, in the mix of the material and the, the stuff that Jim says, there's a lot of 
roiling in there. I mean, if you're taking this story all the way back to Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky being a sort of a pinnacle of Western philosophy in a way, and you can hear in, in the speeches to the class, you can infer whether it's correctly or not some Nietzsche. So, I mean, there, I would say that the, the stuff is maybe there to be plucked out if you're so inclined. Would you agree with that? Mm. Yeah, you, you could, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so big on Nietzsche. <laughs> well, I'm not saying as a, as a sort of anything a like that. You know, there's a sort of, sort of uh, you know, there, there is a sort of, you know, there have been various practicing nihilists, <laughs> you know, for a long time. I, I suppose I'm just not one of them. <laughs> this person here, please. Romantic nihilists. Hi, right, exactly. Hi, there's an ongoing theme about not being complacent, not being bored, not becoming hacked. And I'm wondering, um, for each of you on the panel, was there what was the turning point in your life? I remember Mark earlier in your career you said acting was addicting. What was the turning point in your life when you felt like this was more than a job, it was maybe a calling and something that got you hooked that still keeps that passion going in your life whenever you work on a new project? Oh, just, you know, we think about all the various projects that I've done, the different people that I've worked with. <clears throat> I don't know, every day I just wake up and pinch myself and feel so lucky to have found my true calling and what really drives me and, and, and pushes me and challenges me and allows me to learn and see the world. And, and uh, you know, this particular part is another opportunity for me to do something different, even you know, having missed out on my my college experience and going back to, to, to various universities and sitting with literary professors and going to lectures with people, you know, wandering around UCLA around the dorms after I left with Britain, wondering what my life would have been like. Uh, I didn't want anybody to think that was weird. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just remember the first time being on set with Penny Marshall, even being in the room with Penny Marshall and Dan Levito, and everybody else that I had met in the film world was just very different for me. And then I met them and they spoke the same language and they seemed to be from the same sort of place that I was from. And I remember being on set and it just reminded me that, oh my God, all I ever did was watch movies with my dad. I had seen this movie when I was a kid. The first movie I ever saw in the theater was Hard Times with Charles Bronson. I mean, I knew who John Garfield was and Robert Ryan before I knew who Robert Redford was, or you know, certain Utah Cruz, or the you know the, the guys who were like the stars of, of the day when I started actually making movies. I didn't really know who any of those guys were, so I just felt like you know this uh, it was a miracle that I found found acting and the process of making films. So you came to Martin Scorsese, you read it. <laughs> yes, uh, but thanks again to Bill's Bill's words because uh, you know that was another thing that was kind of going on again, off again. I was like, no, I have to I have to say these words to these particular people in this particular way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, great performance, Mark. Uh, brilliant movie. Uh, questions I have for you, um, and you keep saying, uh, there are very, very well and great uh, dialogues in line. It's really healthy, but there are a lot of moments in the movie when there are no lines. And those are just brilliant. Just amazing. How was, what was your approach then? Because for other times you had the lines to help you, but to communicate the pain, uh, the uh, genius, the addiction, all these things that the character is going through. But what was your approach as an actor? What helped you to bring that in front of you? That's the old preparation. Um, you know, obviously the, the, the material, the source material, all the preparation. Uh, Rupert and I had a very clear understanding of who Jim was where he was going, how he was going to get there, uh, the atmosphere that Rupert created around the set, all the other uh, actors that really came with their A-game. You know, uh, one thing that Bill really does in an amazing way is, you know, he's creating all these really juicy characters. Uh, so when it's John Goodman's moment, it's John Goodman's moment, and I'm still able to be there reacting to him, or the same with Michael or Jessica Lange or George Kennedy or whoever else it was. Uh, even though Jim's in every scene of the movie, I think we, we were able to attract all these wonderful actors uh, because of the material. You know, you know, it's just, you know, you're in it, and you know, with all the different demands uh, that came along with playing the part, I knew that there was still a light at the end of the tunnel. I had my life back. So, uh, as much as it tortured my wife and everybody else that had to be around me, um, I, uh, you know, I just stayed in the moment and, and 
there, there was so much to do that you couldn't get away from it anyway. I wouldn't go home and I wouldn't talk to my wife and my kids the way I would talk to my students in the classroom. It certainly would be in the back of my mind. I came up with a couple of doozies that I couldn't use when I was in a lot of trouble. People, I'm terribly sorry, but I'm getting the uh, throat slitting gesture from the back of the room. If I may just say, yes. I feel like to say two words on, on the topic of addiction. I feel like I, I, I can fair if I just say this. Um, when, when we speak about addiction, um, I would assume that most of us are talking about um, drugs, alcohol, mm -hmm. uh, gambling, eating, shopping. Um, as someone who is in recovery, for me, what I found is that um, those things are not the problem, they're really the symptom of the problem. You know, you can put those things down, like Bill said, and, and, and after a couple of weeks, your body will heal from um, doing drugs or alcohol, but that's not the problem. The problem still remains. It's, um, as, as addicts, we have an, an ability to deal with uh, life on life terms. So we self-medicate, and um, that's the problem. And, um, if, you're, if you've never been addicted to anything that was um, life-threatening, I don't really expect you to understand that. Why would if jumping in front of uh, uh, oncoming traffic is detrimental for your life, why would you keep doing it? Um, it's, I don't expect you to understand, but uh, it's, it's, um, it's a self-love process. Uh, and an ability, an inability to uh, deal with life on life's terms, and and, uh, and deal with our demons. Things that may seem nonchalant or trivial to you will drown an addict. You know, so um, that's that's what I've come to find out. What addiction is about? It's not about the actual thing you're you're abusing. It's about dealing with uh, life and, and and your demons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all.